Welcome back to Crypto Stock Lab. Okay, let's unpack this. If you spend any time tracking the world of decentralized tech, you know the hot topics are, well, they're usually gas fees, right? Yeah. Layer two scaling, maybe the latest regulatory fight. That's all surface level stuff. Yeah. But according to the deep dive sources we've been looking at, those headlines are actually a distraction from what they call Ethereum's biggest silent killer. And that is state bloat. It's this uh, internal pressure cooker that really threatens the network's core promise. It's not just, you know, dramatic phrasing. It's a genuine existential threat. State bloat is the ever-growing weight of the entire blockchain history. Think about it. Every single transaction, every smart contract, every historical record, it all just sits there yeah. accumulating. And right now, to run a full node, which you absolutely need to do to validate the network, your hardware has to store everything, everything that has ever happened. That data load is just becoming massive. So the problem isn't just slow transactions or high fees, which you know layer twos are helping with. The real systemic problem is that it's getting so expensive and so difficult to verify the network that only a few huge organizations with like massive data centers can actually afford to do it. Exactly, and that is the centralization risk. If the barrier to entry to help secure the network becomes too high, then decentralization, the whole point of Ethereum it fails. The system just becomes heavy, expensive, and uh, fundamentally less trustless. If we don't fix this, the entire value proposition just sort of collapses. And all that institutional money that's waiting on the sidelines? It hits a hard security wall. It won't come in. Right. And the fix, this grand solution that's set to arrive around 2026, is the upgrade they're calling Hagota. It's designed to tackle state bloat head on by bringing concept that was, I mean, almost sci-fi before into reality, statelessness. Hmm. And this is a truly foundational shift in the infrastructure. This deep dive is going to show you how statelessness turns Ethereum from just being the most robust crypto chain into what our sources are calling the global supercomputer. We really need to get what this tech means, why it unlocks something like $100 trillion in scalability, and what it implies for major infrastructure owners. Specifically, the company highlighted in the research Bitmine, or BMNR. So we've laid out the two big problems, the ideological threat of centralization, and on the other hand, the commercial problem of not being able to handle massive amounts of data. And the root cause for both is this need for validators to store all the historical data. Yeah, the current system demands total memory. Think of the enormous, just cumulative burden on every single validator. This constant need to access, process, and verify 100% of the historical state every time a new transaction comes in, it's just not sustainable. It grows exponentially. No. Okay, but hang on a minute. Let me push back on that. If the network is already using layer two solutions, you know, like Optimism or Arbitrum, to handle most of the transaction volume and bring down fees, why is state bloat still the silent killer? Isn't that layer two model already fixing this? That's a great question, and it's a really crucial distinction to make. So layer twos, they handle the execution. They process transactions quickly and cheaply off-chain. But, and this is the key, they still have to submit their data, all bundled up, back to layer one, back to Ethereum, for final settlement and security. Ah, uh, okay. And when they do that, the layer one validators still need to check that this new bundle of data is correct, according to the current state of the entire system. So the layer twos are pushing the transactions through, but they aren't actually shrinking the, uh, the underlying history book that the main network has to check against. Precisely you're still making the main database heavier and heavier with every new entry you add. State bloat is all about the size of that core security database, the state history, which is exactly what Hagoda, and specifically this tech called Verkle Trees, is designed to fix. Okay, here's where it gets really interesting. I mean, it's super technical, but the core idea is actually beautiful in its simplicity. Let's use that library analogy from the research to break it down. Mm -hmm. So imagine Ethereum is a massive, always growing library, and the node validators are the librarians. Their job is to protect its integrity. Right, and under the current system, with state bloat, the librarians have to literally memorize the contents and location of every single book, every transaction, every account balance in that entire library. That's why it takes so much storage and processing power to run a node. It demands total recall. But after Hagoda, with statelessness, which is enabled by these Burkle trees, that whole requirement just changes completely. The librarian no longer needs to store or memorize every single book. Exactly. Instead, when a new transaction comes in claiming a certain state like, say, user X has this token, the user provides a tiny, mathematically provable piece of data with it. The sources call this a witness. 
Think of it as a cryptographic receipt. So the librarian gets this witness, which is just a few kilobytes of data, but it mathematically proves instantly that the book or data exists exactly where it's supposed to. The librarian didn't have to store the whole library, just like the master index card, the top of the Verkle tree, that verifies the receipt is valid. And that is the core of statelessness. The validator node no longer needs to store petabytes of historical state to verify new transactions. It just needs the new transaction and its tiny little witness to confirm everything is okay. The difference is just it's night and day before Hagoda. Ethereum is heavy, it's expensive to secure, it's burdened. After Hagoda, statelessness makes the network lightweight, portable, and incredibly fast at adding new data. And the implications for that centralization problem we started with are just, well, profound. If the validation process is dramatically lighter, I mean, you no longer need a room full of server racks, maybe you can just use off-the-shelf hardware, then the economic barriers to entry just plummet. So if anyone, anywhere, can secure the network using a regular computer, you've basically guaranteed universal access to verification. This is what locks in decentralization for good. It's what makes Ethereum truly uncensorable, truly unstoppable. It solves that whole existential crisis. Right. And what's so fascinating here is that this technical fix, which was designed to achieve this you know, ideological goal of decentralization, it also happens to be the exact thing that enables global financial integration. Mm -hmm. So we need to shift our focus now from just network health to the huge amount of institutional money that is waiting for exactly this capability. So you're saying Wall Street is watching Verkle Trees very, very closely. Absolutely. Put your institutional capital hat on for a second. We're talking about the big players, pension funds, asset managers like BlackRock, infrastructure movers like Swift. They care about two things. Security, which statelessness delivers, and scale. And the number they're all looking at is $100 trillion. That's the target. The sources are very clear on this. The goal is to tokenize huge amounts of real-world assets, global real estate, private equity, government bonds, and bring all of that value onto a secure open settlement layer. But the problem is, if they tried to dump even 1% of that data, we're talking high-speed, high-value data onto the network as it is today, the state bloat would just choke the system instantly. It just wasn't built for that. No, it wasn't. And statelessness is that necessary infrastructure upgrade. By getting rid of the need for validators to store all the history, the network suddenly has the capacity to handle almost infinite scale without getting heavy or slowing down. It's a difference between you know, a local dirt road that can handle a few cars and a six-lane fiber optic highway built for global freight. And this readiness, this ability to scale forever while staying decentralized and secure, it has the name in the financial world, doesn't it? They call it finality. Exactly. Finality. It's the moment the network is ready for the big leagues, yeah. ready to bring on global financial instruments without any risk of compromise or centralization. It makes Ethereum an enterprise-grade utility. Which leads us right to the investment implications. The research highlights specific infrastructure owners whose valuations could uh, benefit massively from all this. Now, we have to report these claims impartially, but the analysis is very specific about the impact of Hagoda on Bitmine BMNR. The sources really frame this as a clear inflection point, saying that the current price is low because of these perceived risks. Right. And instead of just focusing on you know specific price targets, let's look at the actual financial mechanism for why the value might go up. The whole thesis is that Higoda triggers a massive re-rating of the company. And this is driven by two key factors that come directly from statelessness. Okay, so factor one is risk reduction. As we've been hammering home, the biggest systemic risk to ETH's future was this creep towards centralization. Hagoda, by ensuring permanent decentralization, basically just kills that risk. And when a massive structural risk is taken off the table, the risk premium that investors demand drops a lot. That immediately increases the value of the underlying asset, in this case ETH. And Bitmine holds a huge treasury, about 3.97 million ETH equivalents. So you have this huge treasury, and once it's seen as de-risked and backed by this truly decentralized machine, it instantly becomes worth a massive premium. You're not holding some risky, volatile crypto asset anymore. You're holding a share in the future financial backbone of the internet. Precisely. The whole capital structure just stabilizes. And then there's factor two, which addresses this tension in their business model. Bitmine is known as an immersion tech and hardware company. So you might think, well, if verification gets lighter and more decentralized, doesn't their specialized hardware become less valuable? Yeah, that's a good point. How does the research handle that? If it gets easier to validate, doesn't the hardware business take a hit? The sources argue that the focus pivots completely. It shifts from the operation to the ownership. 
The value isn't coming from running the heavy machinery anymore, it's coming from owning the massive asset base, the ETH itself. The company basically reclassifies itself from an industrial operator, like a miner, to a strategic infrastructure owner. Ah, so it becomes an asset-backed valuation model. After Hagoda, the research says the market will just value them differently. You're no longer buying a risky miner, which is usually valued on these low PE multiples tied to, you know, operational swings. Instead, you're buying shares in the TCPIP of money. You're buying a piece of the foundational settlement layer for global finance. The valuation shifts from industrial ops to infrastructure ownership, which usually gets much higher, more stable multiples. That is the re-rating process right there. So what does this all mean? The name Hagoda, it might sound a bit obscure, but it really represents the end game for Ethereum's tech roadmap. It's that final necessary step. It's moving the system from the long, messy process of building the plane to being fully ready for flying at Mach 5 with all the institutional safety checks built in. It's the transition from potential to realized capability. And the research suggests institutions aren't waiting for 2026. They're accumulating now because they see the roadmap. They understand that statelessness fundamentally de-risks the entire ecosystem and guarantees the network's capacity for infinite scale. And that ability to onboard and securely scale $100 trillion of tokenized assets, it is absolutely dependent on solving state bloat. Statelessness through vertical trees is the technical key that unlocks that financial floodgate. Hmm. So if we connect all this to the bigger picture and really think about the disruptive nature of finality applied globally, where the internet itself becomes the final settlement layer, it raises a really provocative question for you to think about. When Ethereum becomes truly portable, light, and capable of infinite scale, what previously held assumption about traditional centralized financial infrastructure, I'm talking about the time and cost for cross-border settlement or third-party custody, what part of that becomes completely and utterly obsolete? That is the scale of disruption he goaded is promising. Thanks for exploring this with me today. If you found this breakdown helpful, do me a favor and don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on those notifications. That way you support the channel and you'll never miss our next explainer.